So what's um, um, so, so some of these products uh, represent uh, the um, the highest strength steels that um, you can possibly um, uh, purchase today for applications. So, and um, so, for instance, all the um, the tires uh, have a um, use these these products either as, as the beads here, yes, uh, that make sure your uh, your tire is um, <coughs> airtight, yes, and uh, and then here the the uh, part of the construction of the um, tire, you have these belts of tire cord. Okay, um, very important is in all cases strength, yes, but what is equally important is the cleanliness of the steel. Cleanliness of the steel, yes, cleanliness, very important because the product has a small section, yes. Um, and in particular applications, such as uh, springs, um, you have suspension springs, for instance, and also the uh, valve springs, yes, you need uh, very high fatigue resistance, yes, and it, it also requires a very high level of steel cleanliness in addition to strength. Okay. So these were typical um, uh, wire products, hmm? and then uh, the bar products are shown here, yes, uh, with the, the main applications are shafts, hmm? and a uh, very big application are these um, uh, crankshafts for automotive, yeah, um, heavy springs, carburized gears is also a very big application area for, for bar, yes. Um, and of course, in uh, many cases, for instance, like if you um, have this, um, the shafts, machinability uh, is an additional requirement. Fatigue is important in addition to uh, strength, yes? Okay, so fatigue, uh, fracture is a very big issue. Um, in bar products, yes. Uh, for instance, th this is a broken uh, crank uh, shaft and another shaft here uh, that um, broke through uh, torsional fatigue, yes. Um, so big issue. Uh, and as you know, very often, uh, you may know this from your uh, courses in um, fatigue, uh, and if you're interested in fatigue in general, there is, there is a course that Professor Chong Su Lee teaches on uh, fatigue. Um, internal cleanliness of the steel is essential. Hmm? So, because that's usually where the fatigue cracks are initiated. Yes. Anyway. So, um, have a look um, at these um, uh, products. Uh, these are general, probably covers most of the, uh, the products uh, for wire. Hmm? What are the most important ones are the so-called uh, cold-headed quality products, the tire car products, the wire steel products, the bearing steels, and the free cutting steels. Yes, that's probably what represents the largest uh, tonnage, yes? And when we talk about cold heading quality, we also talk about the products are called fasteners. Yeah? And, 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 and what are fasteners? Well, they're bolts, rivets, screws. Um, you have, of course, uh, when you need to make a wire for nails, fences, the material is softer, yes? And so you have soft wire rod that you use in this case. And what you see um, in terms of the composition, I do want to point this out to you, 
that the compositions are very much composition where we get the strength from the carbon. Yes? Get the strength from the carbon and from what we do to the microstructure. Uh, when you have high carbon, you know that um, if you um, if you have the equilibrium situation, you'll have you know, for this kind of carbon levels, you have ferrite and uh, perlite. Yes, so you can do something to increase the strength by refining the microstructure, great smaller grain sizes, and refining the interlamellar spacing in the perlite. You can also turn this. Uh, 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 steel into martensite. Yes, to martensite. You can tell with what grades you typically would do this, yes, where you see the, the chrome content. Yeah? So, for instance, the chrome content on the higher end. Yeah? For instance, you see here um, chrome contents that are close to 1%. In the case of spring steel, Bearing steels, yes, particularly for bearing steels, that level of chromium points to the fact that we are making martensite. We're not using a perlitic microstructure. And, and the, the, the chromium that's added in this particular case is um, to make the steel uh, hardenable, so you can easily get martensite. All right. Now, it's also very important to realize that the product that's created in the steel plant doesn't really have the properties and the microstructure of the, for instance, the bearing steel or the cold heading quality um, fastener. Hmm? So there are m usually many steps between the production of wire rod Yes, and for instance, a bolt or a bearing or steel cord that you will be able to use in a uh, in a wheel in a, sorry, in a tire. Yes. So let's have a look. For instance, we, we won't go in through through all of them. We will we, we'll, um, we'll, uh, see a few things here. And what what we basically see here is that there can be multiple steps in the processing, yes? The steel company will bring this wire to a company that will do additional uh, thermal treatments, such as uh, spherodizing, before it actually gets to the company that will make bolts or bearings, yes? And give the, 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 the um, um, the steel its final uh, application. For instance, um, POSCO may be making, uh, yes, the steel wire here, but the bolts are not made by, uh, yeah, they're for instance made by a company, very famous company from Sweden, SKF, very uh, huge, uh, or Timken whatever. But these companies are specialized. They don't make steel, them they may not make steel themselves, yes? Um, and, and they buy it, they basically buy these uh, uh, steels from um, steel makers, yeah? Again, what's really important here, yes, is that um, these uh, um, wire steels belong to the, the strongest types of steels you can get. Hmm? Uh, steel cord in the car uh, tires um, easily reach two, three thousand uh, megapascal. Bridge, uh, bridge wires, yes, um, are easily two, two gigapascal, yes, um, uh, standard, yes. Okay. Few words again about the uh, the, the the microstructure here. Hmm? So when you make perlite, yes, uh, you, you can make a fully, because we'll see 
uh, we'll make fully prolytic microstructures, yes, at compositions that are not <coughs> exactly the prolytic composition. Huh? So what, what do I want to say here? If, I, if you look at the, uh, uh, again, uh, the steel is very simple most of the time, yes? You only need to look at the uh, iron-rich corner of the face diagram. So obviously when you have exactly, for instance in this case, 0.8% of carbon, you expect to see, you know, well, it's not strange that you could form a um, ferrite, cementite, lamellus, yes? Um, but it turns out that if I have a composition here or I have a composition there, I can also get a fully perlytic microstructure. And that sounds kind of strange. Why, how can you get fully perlytic if you're not exactly a uh, perlytic microstructure? Well, to uh, understand this, you have to understand why, what makes perlite grow. Yeah? So when, um, well, let's, let's see what makes perlite grow and ask ourselves, why does perlite grow? Hmm? Um, I have here ferrite and I have here cementite, okay? Um, this uh, ferrite has very, very little carbon. Carbon is very, very small. And here the carbon is about pretty high, yeah? about close to seven weight percent. Yeah? Um, and we know that in order to grow, this is gamma, yes? In order for this interface to go from here to here, for the cementite to grow, yes? I basically need to get carbon to go from here to here. Makes sense, right? I have to get rid of it. But then how would that work? Because there's no carbon here and there's lots of carbon there. Why would carbon go where there's lots of carbon already? Uh, obviously, the reason is because the carbon goes from this region of austenite to this region of austenite. Yes. From this area to this area. Now what is the carbon content here and the carbon content here? That is the question. Yes. Not obviously the carbon content, I just told you the carbon con what the carbon content is, the ferrite and what the carbon content is in the cementite, yes? But that's not what makes the carbon move from here to here. What makes the carbon move from here to here is the carbon content at the ferrite austenite boundary and here the carbon content at the cementite austenite boundary, okay? So say, I am, I would like to know what, what, these, what these concentrations are. Yes, what are these concentrations? If I look at this phase diagram. If I look at this phase diagram, well, no problems. Say I'm doing the perlite transformation at this temperature. So this is the temperature at which I do the transformation from austenite to ferrite plus perlite, yes. What is the carbon content at the interface, alpha gamma interface, and the cementite, yes? And so I look at this and I say, well, how am I supposed to know? You know, that I can't get the information, right? The reason is, of course, is this phase diagram, yes? 
tells you what is here at equilibrium. Yes? But we don't have equilibrium. When you do the transformation at this temperature, you still have austenite during the transformation, right? Okay? And in order to know what the concentrations are, these two concentrations, I need to extend these lines. Yes? So I need to, to know where these lines would be if there was no um, um, uh, prolytic transformation, basically, if you want to see it that way. Okay, so I, I basically need to extend, and I can do this computationally, it's not a problem. I need to extend the AE3 line, and I need to extend the ACM line. Yeah? And if you do this, yes, um, what, what is this line here? This line here, um, compositions here correspond to austenite cementite uh, concentrations, yes? And compositions on this line correspond to, excuse me, austenite, uh, cementite, also corresponds to ferrite, austenite. Yes? And of course that continues here. Yes? So this is the carbon content at the boundary between austenite and ferrite during the transformation. Yes? And this is the carbon content at the cementite austenite boundary during the transformation. Yes? And now you can see that yes, it makes sense. The carbon content at this interface Yes, it's higher than at this interface. Yes. And so the carbon will move from here to there. And it will be controlled by the diffusion coefficient of carbon in austenite. That's the controlling parameter. It also means, yes, that I can, I can make perlite, when this condition is achieved, when the concentration here, yes, when C theta gamma is smaller than C alpha gamma, yeah? And so that means I can have, I can form perlite here, inside this triangle. And I do not need to have exactly the perlite composition. I can have slightly less, slightly more. And you can see, it's, so it's not necessary to have 0.8% of carbon. You can make uh, perlite if you have 0.6% of carbon. And it will be fully perlitic. Yeah. Or I can go to 0.9% or higher, and it'll still be fully perlitic, yes? Because perlite can grow. Hmm? All right. the, but you can also see, of course, that things will change depending on the temperature at which I work. Hmm? Okay. So... So that's important, yeah? The, so I have controlling, uh, controlled by the carbon content, yes? Uh, and so, uh, and the process of creating, so this, the start of this process here is at gamma, gamma grain boundaries, you start forming little uh, ferrite, cementite nuclei, so it's a nucleation and growth process, yes? So if you look at the kinetics of the transformation, mm -hmm. I see that very close to AE1, of course I don't get much, yeah? at low temperature I also don't get much in terms of transformation, that's because my diffusivity, carbon diffusivity becomes lower, but there is a maximum rate of transformation, yes? and 
So that's important, and we'll see this uh, back in the uh, uh, when we look at the processing of these steels. Yes, between 600, 550, and 600, we get the very fastest growth rate. Yes. There it takes one second for the uh, perlite transformation to start. So very fast, and that's where we also get very fine perlite. Hmm? Okay, so what is fine perlite? That's where you have a small um, interlamellar spacing, yes? Small interlamellar spacing means that you have lots of interfaces, yes? Lots of interfaces. Yes. So anytime you have an interface, that means you have more energy, yeah, interfacial energy. So small um, um, uh, interlamellar spacings are unstable. Yeah? So if we heat, if you heat this up, it will easily it can easily coarsen. Yes. In fact, from a purely um, uh, you know, thermodynamic point of view, even a coarse perlite is unstable, again, because of all this interfacial energy. And if you keep perlite long enough hmm, at between 6 and 700 degrees C, it will spherodize. The, uh, the perlite will turn, the, the, excuse me, the, uh, the cementite will turn into little balls, yes? And that will minimize the um, interfacial energy. However, from an application point of view, this is this what we want, yes, because that's where we have the best properties. Yeah? Okay, and that's the reason why. Um, so as we um, decrease the, the temperature at which we do the uh, the, 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 uh, the transformation. What we see is that, so again, in the region of 600 to 550, you see here that the growth rate of the, the growth rate of the perlite is very, very high. Yes? And, and, and the corresponding interlamellar spacing is also very small. So you can get interlamellar spacings which are between 0.1 and 0.2 microns. So that's 100 to 200 nanometers. Okay? Okay? So and if you would do, for instance, the transformation very close to the A1 temperature, you would have a um, interlamellar spacing which is 10 times larger. Okay, so it's control of the temperature at which you do the transformation is a very important. Okay, and people, we have, I don't, I don't want to go into this uh, kinetics here. So anyway, um, let's, let's have a look now at our, uh, what these implications are. So, uh, and, and look for instance at a steel uh, wire steel that contains, for instance, 0.6% of carbon, yes? Okay, how would we process this steel? Well, okay, well, first of all, we will look at our phase diagram. We will have to extend the AE, ACM line, the A3 line, yes? Okay, and we will have to look at the... Um, TTT diagram, okay? So what it would be the TTT diagram here? So you can see that as soon as I go below this temperature, hmm, I will form, I will start to form pro-eutectoid ferrite, okay? Okay. If I am in this range of temperatures here, yes? yes I basically continue the same thing. Yes? I only start to make perlite below this temperature, right? So when, I, when I'm in this 
this triangular region. Yes. So if I want to make perlite, yes, I have to make sure that I cool very quickly to this temperature range. Yes. Not, not just being below the uh, AE1 line will be enough. I have to go below this line here, below the AECM line. Hmm? Then I will start making perlite. Okay. Again, we're talking about so so if you would choose a excuse me a transformation temperature around 600, you'd be uh, you'd be fine. Okay, because that's where you would have the maximum um, uh, rate of um, transformation. Okay, good. So, so we know that we want to have fine um, um, microstructure. Of course, when I have less carbon, yes, this means that I'm exaggerating here. Oops, I'm sorry, just the reverse. If I have less carbon than the um, eutectoid composition, I will have more ferrite in my perlite. If I have a carbon content that's higher than the eutectoid, I will have more cementite in my perlite. Okay, that's of course um, it, it, it doesn't. The, the, uh, the amount of cementite will change, yes? So it comes as no surprise that if you plot the, the strength of these um, uh, steels, yes, as a function of carbon content, yes, uh, you will see an increase uh, because you have more cementite, more of this very hard phase in the structure. However, and you can see this here, even if you have a eutectoid or a slightly off eutectoid composition, you can still increase the strength considerably by strain. Yes? So what happens when you strain um, a perlite? You can see here, if I... Um, strain the material, yes. I can have at 0.8 carbon, I can have the same strength as at 1.4 carbon. Yes. And the reason is that if you strain, oops, yeah, if, you, if you strain um, the perlite, you can reduce mechanically the interlamellar spacing. Yeah. So, if I take this material here, yes, I have a certain interlamellar spacing, yes. If I wired, if I wire draw this material, yes, now I have material where the spacing is much smaller, yes, yes, much smaller, okay much smaller than this 0.1 or 0.2 microns. I can now go to 0.05 microns. Yes, so I can, re I can first reduce it, yes? Then what I get after the transformation, okay? So, and, and that is being used uh, very often. So let's now look at some products. And uh, first let's look at cold heading qualities. So cold heading qualities are typically uh, made used to make these bolts, yes, and uh, the carbon content is typically 0.4 percent. Yeah? Um, the structure itself, yes, of these um, uh, 
uh, when you start with the wire, yes, the wire has a perlite ferrite microstructure, yes, but the bolt here doesn't have a ferrite, it has a martensitic microstructure, okay, so uh, we'll go through some processing to make this. So first of all, let's have a look at um, these steels. They're typically what we call medium carbon steels. And these are steels that are used for engineering applications, yeah, to make things with, basically. Yes? So we call them engineering steels. And they're alloyed with chrome and moly, yes, because we want to get a martensitic microstructure. And what are the typical ranges? 0.3 to close to 0.4, uh, about point, about one percent of chromium and about 0.2 percent of lead. Yes, and these are typical examples here. Uh, this is this is equivalent, and you you remember here. Um, SI, uh, 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 SIJ S for steel, C for chrome, M for moly, and 40 stands for 0.4 percent of of carbon. Here the uh, European normalization. 0.42 carbon, chrome and moly, and then the four means we have chrome, yes, and you know that the four here is not four percent, it means four divided by four, this is about one percent, yeah, and here the um, SAE, ISIZ, where we recognize the 0.4 percent of uh, carbon, okay, right, and, and so for, th for these steels, the, this is the composition range, okay? It's, a, it's, slight, it's, it's similar to what you have here, but, but this is a wider range because it covers all the products, yes? Okay? Right, so, so let's make, um, let's go through the steps of making a, um, a bolt, yes? So you start with wire rod from, uh, yes, and, and it's, it's for instance a, um, uh, one of these steels, is typically used to make wire rod, SCM um, 435, for instance, or the equivalent European and American uh, grade. So the first thing you do, yes, is uh, this alpha plus perlite microstructure is, an, is going through soft anneal. Yeah? So this soft anneal is to soften this material, this, this wire. Yeah? The, the, the material has typically, when it leaves the plant, about 900 to 1100 megapascal in strength, yes? So we're going to soften it, yes? So, we c so it can be drawn, it can be drawn, yes? And then, spherodized. So uh, we draw it, so it goes all our section, yes? And then we spherodize it to make it really soft, yes? And that usually happens in a company that's specializing in heat treatments. Yeah? They just heat treat materials. Yes? Get materials, heat treat them, give them back to their customers. Yes? Right? So, this is the, the, so, so when you do the soft annealing, you just go to below A1. Yes? Spherodizing, you may go uh, a little bit higher than A1. Yes? And then this product is now very soft. 500 to 600 megapascal. We're going to use it. We can uh, cold form it. Yes, and that is a, a number of steps. And you start with the wire. Yes, which you cut, upset it, extruding. And you finally make, you thread this bolt, and that usually happens in another customer. That's the actual maker of bolts. Yes, he will quench and temper it, so we get. For this particular uh, grade, we'll get about 1,000 megapascal in strength. Yeah? And he will apply the quench and tempering treatment so he gets a tempered martensite microstructure. Yes? Okay? This is a little bit. So this is the spherodizing. This material is turned into material that looks like this, with very small particles. Yes? Because this material is chromium and molybdenum added, usually it takes a long time to spherodize uh, wire steel. Hmm? So 
Okay? So we will be using a process, yes? We, you cannot use a continuous annealing process because it's just too slow. Yes? So you use what? Something that looks very much like a batch annealing uh, furnace that we've seen for strip uh, uh, recrystallization. Mm -hmm. So in this um, furnace, you, you put stacks of these wires yes, as they're um, uh, drawn or as, as they're produced, yes? And you, uh, you cover them mm -hmm. with insulation uh, cover, and then you put in put over that your furnace, yes? Okay? And then you heat it up, and you, the wire heats up. It, the soft annealing, so usually that's done with the same company. There's the first soft annealing that's right below AE1. The spherodizing annealing, yes, is much, first of all, much longer, 30 hours, yes? And you go slightly above AC1. Yeah, why would that be? Okay, because this is another picture where you, where you um, perhaps see it better how, where the, um, the wire material is. Yeah. The, the reason is, why do we go slightly above AC1 when we do the spherodizing? That's because the cementite particles, we want to destabilize them. Yes? So we partially dissolve this uh, cementite in the austenite. But we leave some cementite in the microstructure, so we get cementite seeds. Yes? So that when this slowly cools down, yes, instead of making perlite, we now get these very nice rounded uh, spherodite shaped um, cementite. Yeah? So and there are many theories and models about how it really happens. Uh, um, and, and you can see some of these models. But anyway, um, and it's, it's very interesting physical metallurgy. But however, whatever the process is, it's a slow process. Okay. So once you have this annealed, um, spherodized wire, you basically cut it in little uh, pieces. Yes. And then you go through the process of making a threaded bolt, yes? Once you have this threaded bolt, you austenitize it. You can do some extra forming, yes? Sometimes uh, necessary. And then you can quench and temper the material, yes? And you end up with a tempered martensite, which can be very strong indeed, yes? Now, High quality, I mean, bolts are very important, yes, in engineering applications. And bolts are no joke. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and you can always recognize a high quality bolt, yes, uh, because it's, it's got the name of the company who made the bolt, yes, and it's also got numbers. And the numbers help you not making the error of using the wrong bolt. Right? Um, so, for instance, here you have six, uh, five, six, and here eight, eight. The eight, eight is, very, is used uh, very, uh, uh, very much in engineering application. The eight, eight tells you that the yield strength is eight times eight times 10. Yeah? That's at 640 megapascal. And it also tells you the tensiles, the UTS. So that's eight times 100. So you do the same on the five, six. 5 times 6 is 300, and 500 megapascals as UTS, okay? And so, again, as I said, this serious business. In engineering uh, uh, construction, uh, you don't mix bolts, yes? Even if they look the same, yes? Why? Because there could be uh, serious uh, consequences if you use a weaker bolt, yes? And... Um, the building collapses, or you know, the machine breaks, or um, you know, it's a high-pressure vessel, and the bolts are not the ones you should be using. There may be explosions and things like this. So very serious uh, um, things, uh, and, and you know, so that's how you can tell um, these are good bolts. 
And usually in engineering applications, they are also specified what kind of bolt you should be using. Okay. Um, another interesting um, application for uh, wire steels are spring steels. Yeah? And so springs can come in many different forms, right? You, you have um, uh, strips, for instance, this um, light um, sp spring here, yes? Um, very commonly used for um, household uh, items. Uh, but also uh, this uh, suspension spring here from, uh, from a car. And, and of course, a motors have also many springs to, um, in the valves, yes? Okay, so typically uh, about 0.45 to 0.70 in carbon content, yes? One of the things you will see in these spring steels is the high silicon. High silicon is because these, these steels are not aluminum killed. Yes? You want them to be silicon killed so you don't have these uh, non-metallic inclusions that will um, impact the um, fatigue resistance. Yeah? The chrome content yes, points to the fact that uh, we need hardenability here, okay? And in certain cases you have copper. So let's have a look. Um, what's also very important here uh, for spring steels is the control of the nitrogen content, yes? Because you don't want nitrogen aging in these steels. Um, it turns out that the nitrogen reduces the ductility of these uh, carbon wires, and we add boron to this uh, this steel to make boron nitride. Yes? And, uh, as, uh, and, and that reduces the effect of the, uh, the nitrogen. Uh, we, you can see the effect of nitrogen on the, um, the um, properties of the, uh, the wire by twisting the wires. You, you twist the wires and um, if there's nitrogen aging, the number of twists is very small. Yes. Um, if you add boron, uh, you, can, you can have uh, enough twists before the wire breaks. Typically, uh, you will need to be able to do a minimum of 40 twists. Okay. Springs have their own technologies when they're made, you know, for instance, suspension springs can be hot uh, processed or cold processed, yes? Coil type springs are usually always um, cold formed, the coil type, yeah? yeah. Hot formed can be is, uh, applied for uh, coil type, but also for leaf type springs. Yeah? And this is a lightweight leaf size spring, but I'll, this also applies to uh, leaf uh, type springs that you use, for instance, for trucks. Yeah? Okay, so let's have a look at how we make engine valves. Yes? Again, um, if the steel company makes wire, yeah? for instance, um, uh, typically that would be uh, 5 to uh, 13 millimeter section uh, wire, yes? It goes through two, two steps, yes? So POSCO makes wire, doesn't make springs, yes? And first place the, uh, the wire goes to is a company that does heat treatment, that prepares the steel so it can be processed by a spring manufacturer, yeah? Okay, so so the first one, uh, customer will, um, will coat it, will make the wire drawing, yeah? so we'll reduce the section of the wire, we'll do patenting. What is patenting? When you deform the, the, the perlite, yes, it's, um, you reduce the, um, the uh, interlamellar spacing, but 
the material becomes very hard. So if you want to continue um, um, processing it, reducing uh, the interlamellar uh, spacing even further, you have to anneal it, yes? And so that's this patenting process here. Hmm? So you do uh, you can wire drawing until you have the required uh, sec uh, section, yes? And then oil quenching and tempering, okay? So that means in this case, you make the final microstructure and properties, right? Now what happens then with the, the, um, the spring manufacturer for, for valve springs again, yes? You do cold forming into, yes? There is, it will be a stress relief after the cold forming. Shot peening, you know that um, in order to improve fatigue resistance, it's good to have compressive st residual stresses at the surface of uh, parts that uh, undergo fatigue um, conditions, yes? Shot peening then, stress relief again to remove uh, excessive um, residual stresses and then pre-setting of the y of the of the spring so you can uh, and then you're done basically what kind of uh, strength levels well for instance if you use an SCE uh, 9254 here about 2000 megapascal in strength the uh, wires for suspension bridges and, uh, and other cables, yes, uh, it's, it's a very specialized business, uh, wires, uh, and in particular cables, because of the, the ways you, um, you thread the wires, basically, you can have um, open spiral stands, uh, strands like this, uh, usually hot dip galvanized steels, steel wires, yes. Um, and uh, they're usually twisted uh, or helically wounded around the core. But you can have more complex uh, versions like uh, where the wires um, are shaped. Uh, for instance, here in this case, you have an outer um, uh, the outer cables here are, are locked, the strands are locked, so you, you cannot access these inner wires, yes? You have Z-shaped wires and they are self-locking. Hmm? Corrosion protection is very important, so most of these wires will um, be um, galvanized. And, and so it, it can be very complex, yeah. so suspension bridge cables are not just little wires you know, next to each other. Yeah. Uh, and, and depending on the application, the stiffness you want, the flexibility you want, you will use different uh, ways of um, uh, organizing the, the wires around a central wire. And uh, also if you look carefully here, um, you can see that um, there is also, you also use a mixture of wire diameters, right? <coughs> For instance, you can see here that in between the, uh, the larger wires, you filled in the interstices with smaller wires, yes? Okay. Right, so let me uh, skip this one here. Very important also in the wires, yes, is uh, because we use this, um, the ability to reduce, to refine the microstructure when we, when we draw the wire, yes, the, the wire diameter, yes, is an is, is essential contributor to strength, yes. So if, if you use, uh, so for instance, same grade here, you know, see this black uh, grade, about 1% of carbon, yes, goes from here to here, you can see that um, if I use, um, say one, two, three, four, a five millimeter wire, yes, will have a strength of a, uh, one 
thousand pascal, but I can go up to five thousand, yes, if I can make the, 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 the wire very, very fine, yes, okay. Okay, so, um, and that's of course what you will use because you don't have to do anything to the composition basically of the, of the steel. Hmm? All right, so, uh, and the wire drawing again uh, doesn't also doesn't have to be um, um, circular. It can be a complex shape, so you you can design very complex uh, cable sections. Yes, and and so um, one of the things you will be uh, doing is this patenting hmm, to get the optimum. Uh, fine perlite microstructure, yes. The uh, where, where you basically want very uh, fine uh, microstructure, and again, you know, the optimal range of transformation will be in the 600 to 550 degrees C. Hmm? In so for the for wire steels, what we see is a evolution from about eutectoid uh, compositions, which give us about um, close to 3,000 megapascal, to higher hyper eutectoid compositions, yes? So uh, 0.8 a eutectoid composition can give me close to four megapascal, and I could definitely in hyper eutectoid compositions with about uh, close to 1%, I can get 4,000 uh, uh, megapascal in strength for cables. Yeah? So typically, uh, uh, in applications such as um, high carbon uh, bridge suspension wire or for uh, tire cord, uh, reinforcement of uh, tires, we, we will use these high carbon levels for strength. Hmm? So, and the strength, the way we work to, uh, on the strength is decrease interlamellar spacing. You can also, of course, increase the strength of the uh, ferrite, but increasing the amount of the cementite is the easiest way to uh, have a very high strength, so to up the carbon content. Um, you can also increase the work hardening of the wire, yes? Again, an increased amount of cementite will improve this. You can do this with higher carbon content, but also higher chrome additions, yes? Oops. And then drawing strains is very important. Use very small sections, yeah? Smaller wire diameters, yes? You can see here, by the way, the effect of um, chrome additions to um, the strength here. So if you just look at uh, a wire that, that's basically uh, perlitic, yes, you see that you can increase the strength by adding some uh, chromium. So very important here is, is, an, uh, um, is the drawing, right? because the drawing allows you to go beyond what the thermodynamics will give you in terms of um, the deformation, in terms of refining the, the grain size, yes? So, and it's also very important to see that, in fact, you could do this with any material, right? So, so if, you, if, if you would use like an IF steel, yes, and you would strain it, as a wire for, for, um, and, and refine the microstructure this way, you, <clears throat> you, would, you, know, you would be able to achieve a two gigapascal without any alloying, yes? By basically refining the microstructure. But if you have a two-phase microstructure like perlite, yes, the effect is even stronger, yes? You can see here um, at uh, the same reduction, you have about five times the uh, the impact of the um, 
um, deformation to smaller wire diameters. Yeah. Nowadays, 100 nanometers and lower are, are very normal in industry in terms of um, perlite refinement. Okay? The uh, high carbon wires, uh, again, you, um, you start with wire rod, uh, will, for instance, be typically, uh, say, five millimeters. You do first wire drawing to three millimeters. First patenting, so it means you, you're going to uh, soften the microstructure again, yes? Um, so you, you reheat it, basically, and then you cool down. You make fine uh, perlite, yes? So you do a second wire drawing. To, uh, from three millimeters to one to two uh, millimeters. Now the strength goes up all the time to uh, 1700, 1800. Second patenting, yes. Of course, the thickness, uh, the, the, the diameter hasn't changed. Your strength is reduced now, 12, 39. You can do, uh, when the wire gets really fine, it becomes difficult to do the wire drawing, so you, you need to know how to do it. And so one of the ways you do it is by coating the wire, for instance, with brass, yes? And um, so now you are at, um, so you start with one millimeters. After, in the third uh, drawing step, you can go to uh, a fraction of a millimeter, a tenth to uh, about half a millimeter. And the strength levels reach more than three uh, megapascal. And then you do the cabling. Yes? There may be many additional steps which are not uh, included here, such as pickling, phosphating. Uh, remember, maybe, that I talked about phosphating. is important in technology because it allows you to reduce friction. Yes? That's a it's not indicated, but it's one important part of the um, um, step for the pr uh, production steps in, um, in drawing. And then, of course, many of these wires, they're extremely high strength. They're very thin, right? Uh, and they're made of steel, carbon steel. Uh, we don't, you don't want them to, uh, to rust away. Okay, so it's also important to coat these wires. Yes? So galvanizing is very, uh, very often used to coat a wire. Yes? Bearing steels are steels which contain probably the highest levels of carbon. Yes? So there are not many steel grades that contain 1%, around 1% 1 of, of carbon. So bearing steels are typically around that level. So they're all hyperutectoid steels, yes? Okay. Again, um, you start uh, making bearing steels by obtaining a... Uh, wire steel, 1% carbon wire steel in the steel plant. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to a company that will do, that will prepare the wire for the producer of the ball bearings or, and other types of bearings. Yes? Okay. And the, the, um, the company that prepares the wire is again mostly a, a thermal treatment uh, company yeah, that will do a low temperature annealing, so to soften the material, to draw the material so you get the right dimensions, yes, and then we'll do a spherodizing annealing, again to make it very soft. Yeah. Why do we want to make this, the wire very soft? Because we need to make very accurate metal balls Yes, from this wire. Yeah? So we need to forge, do some cold forging of the wire 
to make these uh, metal balls, yes? And then we need to heat treat the, uh, the soft balls to a martensitic microstructure. And there may also be surface uh, treatment, so, okay? So typically these bearing steels, they will be um, under uh, divided into through hardening steels or case hardening steels. The through hardening steels, yes, have a very high carbon content, yes, and also tend to have a very high chrome and moly content. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to, when we heat treat these balls, yes, into like an oil bath, the entire structure of the, the, the bearing will be martensitic, will be fully martensitic. If we have lower carbon contents, yes, slightly lower chrome and moly, then only the outer side is martensitic. And the central part can be, you know, bainitic, prolytic, depending, yes? So we want, in this case, that's why would you want to have a, a structure that's only case hardenable? That's because you want to have, for instance, a tougher, more ductile uh, center part of the, uh, the bearing. Hmm? So um, here, this is a typical uh, bearing steel here, 1% of carbon uh, and 1.4% of chromium, yes? for the hardenability. Free cutting steels are also uh, typically uh, wire bar products, yes? Free cutting refers to the fact that uh, these products will be um, going through uh, machining, yes? Like a CNC machine, yes? And uh, carbon contents are typically 0.1 to uh, 0.5, yes? Uh, what is special about these is the sulfur content, yes? Certain free cutting steels will require 0.2 to 0.4% of sulfur. That's a huge amount of sulfur. Remember, uh, for flat roll products, uh, we went out of our way to have preferably no sulfur. Yes. In this case, you add the sulfur in it. And the reason is because when you're working on a workpiece with a tool, in a lathe, for instance, or a CNC machine, yes, if you look here in detail, the, the tool cuts away chips, basically, of the metal, chips away the metal. And the formation of the easy formation of these chips is very important yes and if you have manganese sulfides particles in your microstructure this really helps chip formation so your tools can be used longer and the cut the quality of the cut is better yes okay now i do have to say that these requirements are um, relatively high uh, sulfur contents are really um, lately not so uh, useful because in many cases um, the tool, the quality of the tool material has improved a lot. So the tools can take the higher heat and the higher stresses during uh, the cutting, yes? And also the use of CNC machines has improved the machining a lot. So we don't really have to rely so much on sulfur inclusions in our material to, to get good machinability. It's still important when you drill small holes, I have to say. So in, if, if you have engineering parts that require small holes, there. Um, uh, this uh, presence of the sulfur helps. Very careful, however, when you add sulfur, you get all the negative problems of sulfur in that part. So 
um, you cannot add sulfur yes, if the application doesn't allow for it. For instance, for instance, if you have seamless tubes, yes, and you need to make thread on these seamless tubes, yeah, so the thread, the part that you will use to make the connection, yes, it will be machined, yes, that must be resistant to stress corrosion cracking in, in applications, yes. So, and, and, and so that's no sulfur in this case, yes. Okay, so very important limitation. Finally, and this is not a very high carbon application, it's very important in terms of tonnage, are rebar, low, uh, rebar. Now, you, you have to know that you can make rebar from any steel, right? So you can buy very, ex this is, people typically think of rebar as a cheap product, yes? However, um, there are, um, uh, you can make uh, rebar from very expensive stainless steels, okay? And it depends um, on the application. For instance, in uh, Switzerland, hmm, all the, uh, or most of the um, civil engineering constructions, yeah, like uh, bridges and roads, in the mountains, uh, they use very expensive stainless steel rebars because it's difficult to do to inspect roads and bridges in the Alps. You know, uh, lots of snow and stuff. So uh, you want to have guarantee that you know there's going to be no deterioration of rebar, etc. Hmm? So, and so in in, uh, in um, certain European countries, in particular in the, in the mountainous regions, uh, you will use uh, stainless steel types of rebars. Yes? But most of us think of rebar as, you know, um, very um, a commodity product that is, um, uh, for which we use plain carbon steels at 0.2% uh, of carbon, less than 0.4% for the carbon equivalent, so you can weld them. Hmm? Yield strengths are pretty low, 250, 500 uh, for high strength steels. Hmm? The, the strength can be because of the carbon level or mechanically. You know, sometimes you can, um, you can get work hardened uh, rebar that's just harder because it's twisted, yes? Or more expensive are vanadium microalloyed uh, grades, yeah, where, the, where the hardening comes from precipitation hardening. Okay. Uh, again, here the microstructure of these uh, rebar uh, is um, it's kind of nice. Yes. Um, uh, Typically nowadays, you will uh, you will try to make your rebar both strong, yes, and tough, yes, and that's happened uh, usually this way. And when you make your rebar, you finish the rolling at 900, and then you have a three-stage process. In the first stage, you make martensite at the surface of your rebar by strong cooling. Yes, so this would be what happens to the surface is quickly cooled to below the MS temperature. So the, the, the surface is basically quenched. That's the first stage that you do. And then the second stage, you temper the martensite as a result of the temperature gradient equalization. So you do a very quick cool of the surface, yes, and then you s at this point here, you stop the cooling. So the martensite at the surface is reheated, yes, and tempered. The, um, um, the, um, the, the, the layer below the surface doesn't get to be transformed to martensite and goes straight into the bainite transformation, yes? 
And in the third stage, yes, you also the, the center. In the third stage, the center is cooled, yes. And here we get either upper bainite or even ferrite perlite microstructure. So a rebar, yes, you can see here a section of a typical rebar, 16 millimeter rebar, it's actually has actually quite an interesting microstructure, very hard outer uh, surface that progressively gets softer and more tougher as you go to the center. So at the outside, we have uh, lath martin side. And as you go inside, you get uh, uh, bainite. And so here in the middle, you can even see the uh, perlite in the microstructure. So that makes for nice properties. All right, and so um, and with this uh, small uh, review of products and their physical metallurgy, uh, we'll just stop the session here for today. So thank you for your attention.